terms that are used that all mean the same thing, except the very bottom one, which is one of the ones that I had. What you want the specialty specific language to do is cover you for what you do day in and day out. That definition actually grows up with you as you practice and your skill set changes, your responsibility changes, your duties change. It really does cover you for what you're doing at the time of an injury or illness. All of them will translate into how they define total disability being that you're considered totally disabled in the event that you cannot do your job regardless if you're gainfully employed in another occupation. What the transitional occupation definition does is add a phrase at the end that says, until you make your pre-disability earnings. Now, if we think about disability insurance as income replacement protection, you might say, okay, that's the whole point. What it misses is your earning potential. If I'm talking to a resident or a fellow, that definition's terrible. If something happens to you in training, which it does happen, the company's only responsible for paying you until they can tell you what jobs you can do that make fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year. And there are lots of them. If I'm speaking to an experienced physician who's maybe trying to play catch up, if they're making over a half a million dollars, then that definition may not matter. Had I known that's what I purchased, maybe I wouldn't be as mad as I am now every month, but I thought I purchased a true ONOC policy. I have to hand in my bank statements and my company's P&L every month. And even if my company does well, it doesn't matter if I take a distribution or not, I get penalized. And there are months where I lose my benefit. And I will tell you, I am not making what I made my last year as an attending. Second most important part of a private policy is the ability to keep pace with your income. As you're earning more, you wanna be able to get more without having to go through additional medical underwriting. Part of every application process is something called medical underwriting. There are no secrets. Depending on how much of a benefit we're asking for, you may have to give up some bodily fluids. You absolutely have to answer a million questions a million times. They have access to your medical records, your pharmaceutical records, your motor vehicle records. You only want to have to go through that one time. And then moving forward, we only want to have to give financial information. Different carriers, as you can see, have different terminology. They get triggered differently. Some of the carriers we get to ask every year. Some we're only allowed to ask every three years. There are off anniversary times when we get to ask. We can always ask between training and attending hood. Some of the carriers don't care if you take any or all of available funds. Some companies have specific mandates, and this is all nuance. These are all nuances that you want to make sure that you understand before you purchase a policy. There have been a lot of changes just this year. There are five what we call traditional houses that cater to the physician marketplace. Right now, four of them, their maximum benefit is now $30,000 a month, should the math work. One is still at $20,000. Now, I will tell you that the majority of physicians, $20,000 a month in benefit is enough. For some of our super high earners, some of our private practice physicians, you may actually qualify for more than 20 a month. And again, it goes back to this is not a one size fits all endeavor. And you want to make sure that you really understand what you're getting and not getting. There is something called a residual or partial benefit. 
this is a benefit that kicks in the event that you can do your job, but it's not sustainable. Think about things that cause fatigue. MS, other autoimmune diseases, early degenerative diseases, trying to work through chemotherapy. I will tell you last year was a really bad breast cancer year. Just about every one of my clients tried to go back to work in some capacity during their healing process. And they could actually do their job, but maybe not a 12 hour day. Maybe they couldn't take call. Maybe if they were surgeons, they could do two cases, but not four. These are instances where folks are gonna lose money. What this benefit does is help bridge that gap. It's not gonna make you whole, it's to help bridge the loss. And again, shouldn't really come as a surprise that it really does vary by carrier and design. Some of them get triggered with a 15% loss of income, some it's 20%, and they each have different definitions of how and when they're going to pay out a benefit. I will tell you, there are more residual or partial claims filed and paid every year rather than total. So I do think this one is super important. There is something known as a cost of living adjustment or COLA. This is inflationary protection. Dollar today, dollar 10 years from now. Interestingly, it doesn't kick in until you go on claim. So you are sick or injured, they're paying you. As you hit month 13, 25, 37, your benefit will go up based on the language in the policy. Some of them have simple interest, some have compounding interest, some it's a set number, some there's a range. Again, there are lots of nuances here. Catastrophic benefit is exactly what it sounds like. In the event that something horrible happens and you are left unable to perform two or more of your activities of daily living without assistance, or you are severely cognitively impaired, it's actually an additional benefit. I say it's X plus Y, X being your monthly benefit, Y being the catastrophic benefit. It is admittedly probably the most hotly debated benefit. I am of the ilk, I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. However, if somebody says to me, Steph, I'm really trying to shave costs here, what's the first thing you would get rid of? It's probably the first thing I would get rid of if we're looking at actuarial data. You're more likely to need your monthly benefit than you are a catastrophic benefit. So I want people to max out their monthly benefit. There have been a lot of changes in mental health and substance abuse coverage this year and really over the last several years. It ranges, it's all over the place. It varies by carrier, it varies by state, it varies by what kind of doctor you are. Historically, the insurance carriers really don't want to cover physicians for either of these, and they get put under the same umbrella. Certain physicians, EM, anesthesia, pain, pretty much we can really only get a two-year benefit. There's one carrier where it's two years per episode instead of a two-year aggregate. Outside of those three classes, we do have lots of options. The reason that they're limited is because if you think about Venn diagrams, I love Venn diagrams, I'm a dork, the three groups that go out the most for mental health recently are EM, anesthesia, and actually OBGYN. The three that go out the most for substance abuse have been anesthesia, EM, and believe it or not, psych. Because EM and anesthesia are in the middle of the Venn diagram, it's really hard to get them covered. I always tell people that's really the first big decision that you have to make. Some of the carriers will actually give you a discount if you accept less coverage. You really have to think about what's your family history look like? What does your support network look like? Would you seek care if you needed it? There may be 
a financial incentive to accepting less benefit. Interestingly, the carriers have not yet taken away the discount if they take away the coverage. Part of the reason that there's uh, medical underwriting is it gives the carriers a chance to say, okay, look, we're going to cover you, but we're not going to cover this. Many of us come into training with psych diagnoses and medication. I am better at life through therapy and pharmacology. They wouldn't cover me for mental health and substance abuse, but I'd still get the discount if I opted for the lower coverage. You do want to make sure too that whoever you're talking to utilizes whatever discounts you can get. I always find that it seems a little kind of esoteric and facts in a vacuum. And what I've tried to do in the next section is really present three different stories that I come across a lot so that you can really see where the numbers fall out. And I think it helps a lot. We're gonna make an assumption that all three physicians are making the same salary, same bonus, and have the same group benefit. Remember I said that it tends to be a percentage of your salary, base salary, to a maximum benefit. Physician A is probably who I run into the most. This is a doc who thinks that actually 60% of their income was covered. If you remember, income was 250, bonus was 25. So the assumption was that they were going to get $165,000 in benefit. What they didn't realize was that it's 60% of their base, there's a max, and it gets taxed. So I get to be in the unenviable position of telling them that they were way off on what they thought their group policy was actually going to cover them for. Physician B is what I was. I didn't get a policy as a resident. I didn't know. I got it as an attending. I did not keep pace with my income. So I ended up underinsured. Physician B thought, again, 60% of their income was covered. They were educated and got a resident policy. So all residents qualify for a $5,000 a month benefit. The carriers really don't care how much money you make. They don't care what your group benefit is. Because you qualify for it doesn't mean you need to purchase it all, but all residents qualify for 5,000. As an aside, a couple of the carriers have increased that to 6,000, but I digress. Again, I'm showing you the difference between the assumption and the truth. Physician B is coming out a lot better than physician A, but still nowhere near what they thought they were getting. Physician C is who I want to see, ha, no pun intended, and where I really want physicians to be being well-educated, being well-advocated for, staying in touch, keeping pace with their income, Physician C understood that there was a maximum benefit, understood that it was taxed, and kept pace with their income. And as you can see here, Physician C is in a pretty good position. And again, you're never, I shouldn't say never, most of the time we can't make physicians whole. There has to be a theoretical incentive for folks to go back to work. Like everything in medicine, there are exceptions to the rule and there are times where we see physicians change jobs and have different group benefits where they actually are potentially whole or even overinsured. When I speak with young physicians, I always like to go over some of the big roadblocks that we run into so that in the event that you are falling into one of these categories or have colleagues that fall into these categories, that we can start to change behavior before it's an issue. I'm actually really surprised at how much self-prescribing and friends prescribing for friends is happening. 
I kind of can make an argument. I get it. You're busy. We don't have time to eat. We don't have time to go to the bathroom, let alone go see our own physicians. And it's really easy to just say, hey, Joe, I can't see my psychiatrist next month. Can you write me for my Zoloft? The problem is that the insurance companies want to see a paper trail. They want to see that we're getting the care that we need. And to them, it looks like we're hiding something. It's actually one of the few things that makes people uninsurable. Carriers want to see at least two years of what I call good behavior, meaning no self-prescribing, no friends writing for you. There's proper medical documentation of why you're getting the medicine and that you're getting proper follow-up before they'll offer a policy. Now, it's not every medication. If you're on call and you're having a UTI and, and you ask somebody to call you in one antibiotic, that's not going to knock you out. The drugs that are red flagged are antidepressants, anxiolytics, sleep agents, narcotics, weight loss drugs, ADHD meds, high dose steroids, and believe it or not, infertility drugs. I've had two women in the last six months who wrote themselves for infertility drugs. And I have to tell you as an OBGYN, I thought my head was gonna explode. There are actually a lot of risks involved with those medications. If a friend asks you to write them a script, the first question that you should ask them is do they have disability insurance? I probably shouldn't say this out loud, but if they have a policy, it is automatically renewable and non-cancelable. Do whatever you want. The, if they don't have a policy, you should really tell them that you would be doing them a disservice and that they need to get a policy in place. If you are currently writing your own meds, please stop. Get a doctor who's going to take care of you and good behavior. Women's health is very near and dear to me as an OBGYN. When I started doing this about seven years ago, any woman that had a C-section had future pregnancies excluded. The carriers viewed sections as an abnormal outcome of pregnancy. I went nuts and started sending them ACOG bulletins and papers from hospitals that didn't allow for vaginal birth after section, didn't allow for multiples, didn't allow for breach vaginal deliveries. I am happy to say that over the course of the last six years, I have gotten all of the carriers to at least look at why somebody has a C-section. And sometimes they will write the exclusion as complications of further cesarean sections and not complete pregnancies. I am sad to say that one of the companies reverted back to their old language at the beginning of this year. That will help dictate who I would recommend somebody to look at if that's in their history. We know that as women put off family planning with education and jobs, we are at increased risk for miscarriage and infertility. Women need to get disability insurance in place before the first time they try to get pregnant. If you have had a miscarriage within 12 months of applying, they will put a pregnancy exclusion on your policy. If you have seen REI, if it says that there's an issue with infertility, they will not cover infertility treatments or pregnancy. I have one company right now who is right on the precipice of them saying that they won't cover infertility treatments or the outcome of infertility treatments, but they're not putting in infertility and pregnancy. And the reason being, we've seen lots of women who get primed, meaning they go through IVF for their first pregnancy, and then they have a whoops. They get told that they're always going to need help and they don't. And so I want to make sure that if women have a spontaneous pregnancy, that's going to get covered. We see 
a lot of times where if you've had an abnormal pap smear or an abnormal mammogram in some of our older women, they will put exclusions on your policy until you've had normal follow-up. It's really important to make sure that you're getting the follow-up that you need. And BMI is a big issue. It is one of the few things that changes the cost of policies. Typically, the carriers will just say, we're covering this or we're not covering this. BMI, they actually will make you pay more. And so now is the time to get in the best shape that you can and not have that be an issue. I will also say that one of the fights that I've been involved in the last two years has been for certain populations who tend to trend low. We know that the average BMI chart is based on Caucasian men, European Caucasian men, and that not everybody fits that paradigm. And we have been able to advocate for physicians after proving that BMIs have been stable for a really long time. Ultimately, people want to know, what is this cost? It, it's not cheap. We take into account many factors. Age, the younger you are, the less expensive. I am sorry to say that it is more expensive for women than it is for men. We get a little bit of a break on the life insurance side, which is more expensive for men than it is for women. It depends on state. It depends on what kind of doctor you are. Certain doctors have higher risk potential. And the biggest, I wouldn't say, yeah, the biggest reason I tell people to get this stuff while they're in training is because there are discounts that are available while you are in training that once it's locked in, it is locked in for the life of the policy. If you wait until you're in attending, you don't have access. And these discounts range anywhere from 10 to 40%, which is not insignificant. And so you really want to get this done before you finish training. I tell people you want to get in as young as possible. Just because you qualify for the resident package doesn't mean that you need to purchase it. We can play catch up as you ascend in your training. And the game kind of changes when you become an attending. As I mentioned earlier, residents all qualify for the same package. When you become an attending, how much you qualify at any given time is dictated by internal algorithms that look at how much money do you make, what benefits do you receive, and who pays for them, because remember that affects taxation, and then the carriers tell us what you qualify for. It's not like someone can say to me, hey, Dr. Pearson, I want $20,000 in benefit a month. I'm willing to pay for it. If the math doesn't work out, the math doesn't work out. We can't get more than what they tell us that we can get. And so it's really important that you're talking to somebody who really understands this process, is going to stay on top of you, make sure that you're keeping pace when you should, and that you're moving along in, in the right space. My hope is always the second time around that it makes sense when you're talking to somebody. I did put my contact information up here. Every time I hear you speak, I just learned something new. Thank you so much for all yeah. the valuable information. It's a, a few months ago when you gave the first talk for Andwise, I just, I've never heard anyone mention the point about self-prescribing or friends, and it's just so important. I've had a disability policy in place for many years, but after our third child was born, I tried to get a laddered life insurance policy, add another one. Mm -hmm. And it came, mm -hmm. it came up why one of my cardiology friends had prescribed me a factor 10 inhibitor for 30 days after I got COVID. And that it was a good po point on the insurance companies on their end, because they were like, your primary care physician doesn't have a record of this. And right. who, who right. gave you this drug and why? And for me, it wasn't a big deal. My insurance agent answered it. They didn't want anything else from us, but it could have turned into like a nightmare if I didn't have any other policies in place. Such an important point amongst many of the other things you brought up. Thank you again. <laughs> and do you want to share that contact slide again for the last part? So that we sure. can include this in the recording. So 
on and wise and we're just we're so thankful that you made time for us we don't have any sponsors we don't have any paid partnerships we're just so mission aligned with uh dr pearson that we're, we're all about empowering medical students residents and physicians and everything i've ever seen of her i think she is too yeah thank you, thank you so much for the time again thank you uh, for, thank all right thanks everyone bye, bye everybody, bye, everybody.